little technicalities to take care of here. This morning is Mother's Day. And I would like to speak about one of the mothers of Israel. I don't know if I'm any good at telling a story, but I'm going to try. And I'm not sure where the story. So I'm going to start with Sarah. Sarah became a mother, and she called her son Isaac. Now, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, had two boys. One of them, whose name was Israel, went down to Egypt. But his wife, Rachel, was not able to go with him. These people were very good at genealogy. You know, keeping record of who was born to who. Nowadays, we'd say, it's all in your genes. Take a look at your DNA, and you can tell who's who in the family. The book of Exodus starts out with a record of Israel's 12 sons. Four were born to his first wife, Leah. Two were born to Bila, who was Rachel's handmaid. And then two were born to Zilpha, who was Leah's handmaid. And then two more were born to Leah herself. And then, as we said, two were born to Jacob's wife, Rachel, Israel's wife. Now, lots of people could make a really good Mother's Day message out of that, but we're going to go on. Their descendants, the children of Israel, lived in Egypt for 400 years. And now we're getting closer to our story. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1, there went a man of Levi and took a daughter of Levi as his wife. She was a very special mother, just like all mothers are. By this time, the Egyptians had put the children of Israel to slavery. But this mother's son grew up in the palace of the king of Egypt. You know the story. He killed an Egyptian and he fled away to Midian. And there, God told him to lead his people out of Egypt and back to the land that he had promised to Abraham. Well, they didn't get out of the country until it had been totally decimated by 10 plagues. Finally, they were on their way to the promised land. And back in Egypt, one of the mothers pulled out her cell phone and called up one of her friends in Canaan and told her all about it. Wow, you should have seen that. There I was, kneading my bread, and right there, in the dough, yuck, frogs. Frogs and more frogs, everywhere, frogs. In fact, the news of what happened to Egypt spread far and wide. How many times did God work a miracle for the children of Israel? After they spent time at the mountain and got the Ten Commandments, they went straight up to Kadesh. The Bible says it would have taken them a couple of weeks to go from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea, which is right on the south side of Israel, the Promised Land. But it took them a while longer than that. They stopped at the mountain, and they were actually there at the mountain for quite a while. But finally, they went up to Kadesh, and they sent the 12 spies into the land to spy out the land. But the people didn't believe God, and God turned them around and sent them out into the wilderness. And that is found in Numbers chapter 14. It took the people 40 years to get to the promised land. Well... I have to correct that a little bit. It took 
40 years for their children to get to the promised land. And those 40 years take up only six chapters in the book of Numbers. Then the children of Israel went around by the south end of the Dead Sea to go up to the River Jordan across from Jericho. In the meantime, Miriam died, and I began to wonder about Miriam. Was Miriam a working mother? There's no mention of her ever being married. There's no mention of her ever having children. We don't know if she was a working mother. She certainly had a part in leading Israel. And while they're going along there, we found out that Moses couldn't go into the land because he struck the rock instead of speaking to it like God told him to. Remember the people complained that they didn't have enough water and Moses got a little stirred up about it and struck the rock. While they were on their way around that south end of the Dead Sea, they met with resistance. Just one example of that resistance was Edom. They wanted to go through Edom on the main highway there. That's where the rose red city of Petra is. But the king of Edom said, no, you can't go through here. Moses reminded them in Numbers chapter 20 and verse 14, you know, he said, how much troubles we've had. We went to Egypt and God brought us out of there and we are asking our brother if we can go through your land. But the answer was no. So they had to take a long detour down around Edom and come up the other side east. And take notice of that. Moses said, you know the troubles we've had. News had spread far and wide of all the things that had happened to Israel. All from way back, right back to Abraham there where we started. And then Aaron died. Well, they didn't get out of there without a fight. <clears throat> it wasn't with Edom, but it was with another Canaanite king, and God won that battle for them. So they went all the way down around Edom and came up on the east side of Edom and the Dead Sea, and they had to fight their way north. And God won all those battles for them. And when they finally got to the Jordan River and they set up their camp there, that's when they had that incident with uh, Balaam and the talking donkey. That's where that came out. And that didn't turn out good for Israel at all. They began to mingle with the people of the land and to worship the idols of those people. While some of the people were following God and weeping over what had happened, that's when Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, took a javelin and executed the man and the woman for adultery. And the Bible says God turned away his wrath from the children of Israel because of what Phinehas had done. Ever since Moses had reminded Edom about all their troubles, mothers had been calling up their friends on their cell phones and telling them all about it. Israel's coming, and you know what happened? Numbers 20, Numbers chapter 20 is where they finally did the second census. This is why the book of Numbers is called the book of Numbers. When they started out, they did a census and they counted all the people. And now just at, toward the end of the book of Numbers, they counted everybody. And that's when they found out there was only three people left who had started out from Egypt. Joshua, Caleb, and Moses. Moses was still with them. 
Now, if you read the story, you'll find out they must have been on the east side of Jordan for some time because they had to fight their way all the way up there. And they, they actually went up further all, all across from the Sea of Galilee and back down again. So they had been over there on the east side of the Jordan River for some time. In fact, they were there so long that when it came time to actually cross the river, two and a half tribes decided, oh, we don't want to go over there. We want to stay here where we are. And then, of course, to add to all that time that it took, Moses preached the whole book of Deuteronomy to them. You talk about a long sermon. That's, I think, the longest sermon in the Bible, the whole book of Deuteronomy. Moses said, okay, everybody sit down. I'm going to tell you something. And he went through that whole book of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> And then Moses himself died. So now there's only two of them left. The book of Joshua opens up with God commissioning him to, quote, be strong and of a good courage, for you will divide the land among the children of Israel, which I swore to give to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night to observe to do all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have great success. And the people even promised to follow Joshua. Remember, they had promised they were going to follow Moses, and now they're promising they're going to follow Joshua. So, in preparation for crossing the Jordan River, Joshua sent two spies who meandered into the city and wandered around for a while, looking like a couple of tourists. They had cameras and binoculars hanging around their neck, even though they were being very secretive about it, according to Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1. And they ended up can you imagine it? They ended up, well, <coughs> chapter 2, verse 15 says, the house was perched up on the wall, on the town wall. Now, I was reading online, and it said the town wall of Jericho was getting close to 30 feet high. And the house is up on the top of that wall. Now, you know there was no door going from outside the city through the wall into that house. So those spies had to have gone into the city gate and wandered around in the city before they got to that house. And then chapter 2, verse 1 says they lodged in that house. And that word lodged is the word for laying down. So it looks to me like they intended to spend the night there. And that got me wondering, what was it? Some kind of motel? They intended to spend the night there. The Bible doesn't tell us much about this story, but can you imagine? There's these two spies standing in the doorway... And Rahab calls out to them, so what can I do for you boys? Um, help me. Rahab called out to them, so what can I do for you boys? In the meantime, the king heard about them. And in verse 3, he sent a whole cohort, cohort to the house to get them. And the captain stood there and said to Rahab, the men are spies for Israel. Now, right here, this is our story. It's that blank space in your Bible between verse 3 and verse 4. 
It's that little blank space between those two verses. You know the saying, a picture tells a thousand words? Well, in this case, a little tiny blank space tells a whole story. What would your reaction be if you went to the door and there were two guys who are six foot six and they're all dressed up like policemen and rubbing their hands together? Well, maybe Rahab knew them already, so maybe she didn't react too much to the fact that there was a cohort of the king's guard there. I don't know. But I do know that what they said to her got her attention. They said, these two men are spies from Israel. Now we're talking about that little space between verse 3 and verse 4. Now we know who it was. You remember in, back in Egypt, those ladies got their phone, cell phone out and they phoned up their friends in Canaan? Now we know who they were talking to. They were talking to Rahab's grandmother. Talk about a 180 degree about face. Now our story is not about Rahab saying, well, boys, what can I do for you? Now the story is about what Rahab did do for them. Just like that. In less time than it takes for you to notice that blank space between those two verses, Rahab changed her mind. If you look in the... In Joshua there, Rahab did say, oh yes, they were here, and I didn't know where they came from. But she did not say, in fact, they're still here, come in and get them. She did not say that. She did say, they went that way, if you hurry, you can catch them. To be more correct, in the blink of an eye, God totally transformed Rahab. Why? Why did he totally transform her in that little space there? Well, I looked up the census of Jericho, and right now it says there are probably about 20,000 people in the city of Jericho. But back at that time, there were probably only 2,000 people. It was called a city. It was a big place. It had a wall all around it. But there were probably only 2,000 people. And what's your guess that Rahab knew all of the men in the town? She knew that these two guys did not belong in that town. Like she said, she didn't know just where they did come from. From all of her grandmother's gossip and from all of her contacts from her profession, Rahab heard about Israel. And when she was told that these two men came from Israel, just like that, Rahab believed in God. Everything that she heard that whole story where I started from Abraham all the way through that story, Rahab had heard all of it. And just like that, as soon as she heard these two men come from Israel, all of that flashed through Rahab's mind, right down to the time when that captain is standing in front of her saying, these two men come from Israel. She realized God is real, and God is the only true God. Remember, all those people around were worshiping idols and this and that and everything else. Rahab realized right in that little gap between those two verses, God is God. God is the only real God. Oh, yeah. Do you think that Rahab's mouth popped open and her eyebrows shot up? Like that, when the captain said, they're from Israel? I don't think so. I think that would have been a kind of a giveaway. 
they would have known that uh, those guys are, are still in the house. They wouldn't have fallen for her telling them that they had gone back to the river. No, when you come to verse 4, I think she said, just a minute, I'll take a look and see if they're still here. And she went back into the house, and she hustled them up to the room and hid them under the flax up on the roof. And then she went back down to the door, and she said, well, they were here, but they are gone. They went out of the city before the gate was closed, and uh, if you hurry, you can catch up with them because they were on their way back to the ford by the river there. We find that in chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. Talk about your whole life flashing before your eyes when you're drowning. Everything that she had heard came back to her in that blank space between those two verses. The whole story. And I think God was sitting up there wishing that all the people of Israel would believe the way that Rahab did. I took notice of a little bit that uh, modern women might really pounce on if they noticed it. Rahab said to the two spies, Please show me a kindness and promise me that you will save my father, mother, brothers, and sisters. But when the two men of Israel answered, they replied, We'll save your father and mother and brothers. They left out the sisters. They did not venture them. Rahab immediately was thinking not only about herself, she was thinking of other people. She was thinking of her family. She said, I want all my family to be saved too. Now, I don't know if you've thought about it when you read through that book of Joshua. It probably took five or six weeks or maybe even longer after that, before Israel finally came and God conquered Jericho for them. That took some time. Remember, she told the spies to hide for three days before they went back to the river and crossed across to tell, to, tell Jake, uh, to tell Joshua about what they found out. And then they had to go through some rituals, and then they had to do this and that, and a few other things, and some more time lapsed, and they finally crossed the Jordan, and it took a while for them to get across, and then they sat there for a while before they started. It took, it took probably five or six or maybe even longer weeks for them to finally get there. How long do you think it took Rahab to get all of her family into her house? I kind of think she probably had them in there the next day. I think they were all at her place there for quite a while. Now, if you remember Lot and his family, the angels came to Lot and they said, time to get out of the city. Go get your family and let's go. And Lot went to his family and they thought he was a few bricks short of a load. Well, these, this family had only Rahab's word to go on to say that they would be saved. They, they were just taking her word for it. I don't know if you noticed another thing there. Um, those of you who come to the Sunday night fellowships, we were listening to Otto and Otto said, the first thing you have to do before anything else is praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. When Israel went around and around and around Jericho, out in front of them was the band, and they were playing a happy tune. And I was wondering, what did Rahab's family think? They're perched up there on the top of the wall, and here's these guys going around and around the city playing a happy tune. What did the family think? <clears throat> so what happened with Rahab? What about Rahab? If we go over to Hebrews 
chapter 11, verse 31. It says, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. And James 2, 25 says, Was not Rahab justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Rahab became one of the mothers of Israel. She was right up there with Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel. She became, in fact, a great-great-grandmother of David and a great-great-great plus a whole bunch more greats of Jesus himself. And that was in both lines, Joseph and Mary, both lines. If you follow them back, recorded in Matthew and Luke, Rachel is, or Rahab, sorry, is in both of those lines. So what did it take to make Rahab a mother of Israel? Um, mom. She trusted God. She heard all of those things that had happened to Israel. They were all up there. She had heard them all. And when she was confronted directly with him, she trusted God. Just like that. As soon as she heard, these two guys, this is Israel standing right here in front of me. She didn't see those two guys. She saw, this is God. And she trusted God just like that. Today we pray that all of our mothers would so recognize God and trust him. And Bob is kind of a long ways away, but he's coming, he's coming. <laughs> And so we think of Rahab, we think of mothers. And this is Mother's Day. I, I began to think about that story and I began to wonder, what, what was it with Rahab? Where did that big change happen? And that's where I began to look at that little space between verse three and verse four. Ah, yes. That's where it happened, right there in that little space of time. Between the time the captain said, uh, these guys are from Israel, and the time that she said, uh, hang on a bit, I'll go inside and look and see if they're still here. She, she did a total about face right in that little space there. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Bob, and we got one more song to sing. 